I think I'm caught up on all of your posts until perhaps the last, oh, maybe 24 hours, 20 hours. So if you posted something within the last day, I think I noticed there are a few of them, just a couple that I haven't gotten to. But other than that, I think I got caught up in all my classes. Um, there were a few that I asked to resubmit. I hope that the machine <laughs> indicates that because they send me emails saying, yes, I resubmitted, but I, gosh, trying to keep track of all that. I'm hoping that just when I go back to the machine, it will, you know, it will show me that it needs to be graded or that it was resubmitted or something, and then I'll take care of it. Remember that from now on, if it's two weeks late or more, you must have a reason. Um, again, we're talking about stress. And I understand, as obviously, especially since COVID, I think the article on stress is particularly relevant. I'm sure that there are other things, you know, but this isn't a this isn't a you know medical school class, it's a philosophy class. So it does, you know, it it does have a lot of implications for how you can manage your stress and how to prevent um, the stress response and then the cortisone and all of that. And the thing that I think is interesting that I'm connecting it to Aristotle's virtues, right? That health is a balance. And um, Aristotle was a doctor's son. And Aristotle's virtues often are not considered biological because there was this assumption that ancient cultures were very backward in their science, right? So modern science dismissed the wisdom traditions, but the wisdom traditions have come back, you know? Scientists have noticed that, gee, Buddhism, you know, there's a, you can, you can put electrodes on these monks' brains and you know what? It really helps their brains work better. Meditation really decreases the stress response and it does all this other cool stuff. Well, yeah, they weren't dumb. And then Hinduism has this uh, extremely insightful about body, mind, soul connections. They have diet, they have breathing, they have um, you know, the different chakras of your body. I Again, I don't know all of it, but I know that it was a very fine-tuned system based on just intuition. You can have an intuition about what's going on in your soul. They just used to call it your soul. And then the moderns came along and said, oh, soul, that's that awful thing that's unscientific and you're born with it and it never goes away and it lives after death and all that stuff. So, so these articles are pointing out that, you know what? <laughs> that's not really what those words ever meant, right? One of them uh, meant breath, it was the same word as breath. God breathed into the clay, right? And then that has a physiological side to it. But the thing that I emphasize, just because there's limited amount of energy for anybody to do it all, is um, I studied Aristotle's view of the psyche. And the psyche is just activities of, of soul, psyche, in accordance with virtue. And that means dunamis, that we're born with these capacities for all of these, all these capacities, pleasure, fear, um, anger, um, friendships. But then we have these uniquely culturally emergent properties and they're not superimposed on nature. Again, I wrote a, 
there's very well-known neuroscientists now that say basically the brain evolved over time. It got more complicated. It created a more complicated social political system, the networking, there's a whole layer of cloud, right? There's a whole layer of physical, it, of reality that isn't a material thing, but it's a set, a network within a society and your relationships to other people, according to the various networks, has an incredible impact on your body chemistry and your brain chemistry on the way the neurons fire on the neural maps that you form over time. So the connection between um, brain, body, mind, spirit is all united. And so these articles are all uh, pointing out that there's no gap between religion and science. There's no gap between this soul um, and just how we actually operate in the world. And then the, my, uh, the name I give to spiritual humanism, that the spirit, the human spirit creates ideas about the good life about flourishing, about what kind of relationship do you want with this person? What kind of job do you want? Because the job you want is not just going to have to train your brain. It's going to put you in communities with like-minded people, with people who have similar intellectual training or skills, and you will be talking to them and relating to them. <laughs> And that's the emotional side. So no matter what intellectual training you get, you have to see it in the context because it will play itself out in a, in a set of um, cultural networks that have that that will affect your emotions, that will affect your character. And that will determine things like stress, depression, revenge, or that flourishing that Mr. Newland talked about. But of course, COVID has been um, an example of the kind of suffering that people go through. And then of course we want someone to blame. So we have to play the blame game. And politicians are very good at trying to gain votes by figuring out what people are afraid of, what they fear, or what they fantasize about, what they imagine themselves like. And then the politician will tell you, you know, I will protect you from that thing, or it's that country's fault, or that person's fault, and I will go after them so that you are safe. And, or I will enable you to live out your fantasies of whatever it is. Um, but what we really have to look at today, where today I'm looking at, this is the last lecture about personal experiences of depression, stress, revenge. And they aren't separable really from your social networking, your relationships and your culture, but it's more so than what we start doing next time. Next time we start with the virtue of a citizen. So learning how to think like a citizen and learning how to be passionate about being a good citizen, um, deliberately teaching yourself to get pleasure and pain uh, in a way uh, because through relating to people in ways that can create a more stable social and political life. So that's starting next time. We'll do that for a couple weeks. But this time we're just going to focus on experiences that for a lot of you and also for people who have these experiences, they seem really personal, right? So um, Mr. Newland 
went through depression. He had obsessional thoughts. And, and then he, he, you know, became an atheist. And then he decided, now, wait a second. Um, a lot of religion is actually about what my medical practice uh, shows me is a well-flourishing life. So maybe I was wrong about all religion. Not all religion is obsessional thinking, is based on fear. And so for Mr. Newland, uh, religion was negative in terms of his brain chemistry. But if you notice for Mr. Solomon, he had that same strict Orthodox Jewish background, and that was very reassuring to him. Um, so I don't know how many of you would like to explore that, but I know at Lyon College over the last 25 years, um, students come having had a religious upbringing that usually is fear-based, most of them. Um, but whatever it is, some of them really want to work that out, right? They want to think more deeply about it. And so these texts give you some really good examples that liberates you. Like you don't have to do it any one way because Mr. Newland, he suffered under Orthodox Judaism. He, he cured himself of it. He went through his atheist phase. His final view, he says, well, you could have a God or you could not have a God and you still have this flourishing. So that's where he ended up. Um, Bud Welch and the issues with revenge is that you can use religion to justify revenge, which obviously a lot of people do. Or you can use religion to really punish the bad guy, right? A lot of people who believe in capital punishment think that it's God, right? It's Christian because, you know, people are evil, so you kill them. <laughs> the, the other side of that is that people can always change. So the Pope, the Catholic Church actually changed its position on that. Um, originally, it had this view that they took from Aristotle, which I think is an interpretation of Aristotle. I don't think it's the best one at all. But it was a Christianized version that if somebody kills somebody, they remove themselves from society. And so society has no obligation to protect them. And so basically they're dead, right? They, and so the society just kills them because they have chosen to completely remove themselves from any of the protections or whatever that society has to offer. Um, but, the reason the Catholic Church changed is because in theory, you can always change. You can have a conversion experience in prison, which people do. And so no human being should deliberately kill another human being when, it, when they could actually completely change. You know, you kill them because they're so evil, but they always have the potential to turn around. And so that's why you don't kill them. Like you're playing God. <laughs> All right. So that was that. Um, religion. So Bud Welch went from a view where he probably used religion to justify capital punishment. But then what got him to change, there were a few things. His brain chemistry. So we're, you know, we're doing brain chemistry stuff here. Um, First of all, he knew that Tim McVeigh was in prison and would never get out of prison. So he could trust the legal system to take care of it. In terms of any sort of personal security, McVeigh isn't going to get out and get after him or the security of any other people, person. So you can't he um, couldn't use the, the reason, well, he could always get out. He couldn't get out. That was it. So once he's got that in place, 
He doesn't have basically a stress response. He's not afraid that this guy's going to get out. He can relax on that. Then the next thing was he met the father, right? And all of a sudden he had some empathy. Like this is a dad. His kid played baseball, you know. What happened? How did the kid go bad? But once he understood that what could happen to somebody could happen to anybody, and that I, I had that experience raising my kids. Every once in a while, there's a family that seemed like the perfect family, and their kid would just go south, you know, and everybody, everybody worried, right? Could that happen to my kid, that they could just was there something there that the family knew about that we didn't know about? But the idea is that Mr. Welch could figure out it doesn't, killing one more person doesn't help anything. It doesn't prove anything. And emotionally, he didn't want that blood revenge anymore. So the reason why people took blood revenge is because they didn't have any other system to trust. So you mess, you know, you kill my kid, you mess with me, I'm going to kill your whole family, you know, and you'll think twice next time. So that was kind of the only way to get people. And again, there's all this chemistry, right? Uh, fear. But if you take the fear factor away, and then the other side of it is empathy that you can understand somebody else's pain and you can realize, wow, I could be in this situation and learn how the golden rule, right? That again is you have to wire your brain and wire your emotions and teach yourself how to live your life in a way that, you know, quite in terms of body chemistry will and it keep you stable, stabilize you. Okay. So on the depression one, I'm assuming that a lot of you have, um, you've brought your three reactions. So I am going to just read over some of what I had here. But um that, that is only to remind you before, you know, what you were thinking of. And for the students who didn't come with something, I'm giving them an out. <laughs> so everybody should be able to find something to talk about in your group. And I'm serious about that, right? Everybody needs to talk. Even if you didn't come prepared, you should have something, something in what I'm about to say should be something that you want to contribute. That's one thing. The second thing is, please ask a question. Um, and the third thing would be to please choose a leader who hasn't been the leader before. All that person has to do is get the conversation started, make sure everybody's talking, just make sure, you know, at this point in the class, nobody should feel too lost and everybody should feel on the spot. You have to learn how to be articulate about what you read. All right. So um, there is, they just talk about, there's this complete lack of vitality, right? So, um, and you can measure that in terms of brain chemistry, right? That you're separated from um, your natural vitality. So when Mr. Newland says, actually, you know, it's amazing how our system is set up to um, when we act virtuously, everything is, all the neurons are firing, right? So depression is the opposite of that, the opposite of vitality. Um, uh, let's see. And one of the reasons why mental illness is stigmatized in America, and you can, those of you in other countries, 
is it is mental illness stigmatized like you're suffering because god right wants you to suffer <laughs> and um or because you don't have enough faith or something like that so you can think about whether um people that you know actually believe things like that it's a disease of your soul um and it's your guilty and it's your fault now I had a student, I've had students whose parents have told them, you know, people want to be evil. People are born wanting to do evil because it's evil. And so you can't trust other people. Everybody has to go to church and try to pray to Jesus is the only way to be virtuous. And um, if you get depressed, well, that's because you know, you're not turning to God. Or if you're stressed, that means you don't have enough faith that God's in control or something like that. And the trouble with that is, if you base everything on faith, you don't do anything to fix problems, right? If a drunk driver, a truck, a driver of a truck who is drunk and kills your little kid, if you think it's God's will because you're getting tested, you're not going to inquire about what about that truck company? How come don't they, you know, don't they have strict rules about drinking and driving? Had this um, driver gotten caught before? Did anybody know? And have laws saying if you knew that one of these, one of your drivers, had ever been caught driving drunk, you should have fired him on the spot and you're liable, right? So there's two different ways to deal with the issue. But if you don't look at, well, what are the causes and try to fix it, then people, if they keep turning to God, the world around them is gonna be extremely stressful and they're going to have stress responses all the time because they're not allowed to try and inquire about what's going on outside, but also in your brain, right? If you literally have a stress response or you're depressed and there's the chemistry is there, right? But if you get told, you know, that you're not praying hard enough, well, it's not gonna fix anything. It just makes it worse. So the traditional view is the standard sort of unreflected views really separate religion from science on this one. But these articles are trying to say, no, <laughs> no, um, you can accept everything that the sciences are finding out about the connection between our ideas and our body chemistry and our um, ability to flourish. You can say that, of course, like Parker Palmer says, God doesn't want me to be living, having a living death, like God wants me to be vital. So, um, but there's also the going through the valley of the shadow of death. So um, religion shouldn't just try to deny that people get depressed, but they don't see it as punishment or a test. They just see it as acceptable. I mean, Parker Palmer didn't feel guilty. He, other people made him feel guilty, but he himself just thought there's no God that would want this and I'll just work it out. Um, another point I wanted to make is that, um, Love, love is a need. And I went through this and we'll go through this again on suffering that we love each other because we need each other. That's why a lot of little kids, their parents can be pretty abusive and they still love them because they need them. And as they get older and they don't need them as much, they get a lot more critical. And they can understand that their parents were not 
um, obeying, not acting like parents. So, um, so love is a need and it's because we need each other that we actually can experience those very deep feelings of love. The trouble is we can also get hurt by other people uh, for that same reason. So, and the same is true of love and fear. Um, so, in both articles, there is this, this uh, issue of the extreme and the mean. And so, we're going to do depression first. But it says, depression is at the extreme end of the mood spectrum, which enables us to love and experience intimacy and all kinds of friendships are based on this capacity to love, right? But then it can go too far and that's where you fall into a depression. Um, okay, so you can appreciate the fact that we need each other, human interdependence, but we can also understand that, that the, the emotional bonds we have are, you know, pretty vital, they're pretty active, and they can get too much, too little. I mean, you can start going to extremes, and then sometimes your body just collapses. Um, let's see. And he does, Parker Palmer distinguishes between false crosses and real crosses. Again, people can really misunderstand when accuse someone of depression because they don't have enough faith and God is just testing you or something. So, so that's important to think about that. And then, um, and Anita Barrows was, um, yeah, her mother was talking to God as a little kid. So you do have to be careful as a parent when you use that word I didn't use that word in front of my kids because I had no idea what they would associate it with. I just tried to set an example, right? And, um, but I know a lot of parents, my students tell me stories. They use that word God to really mess them up. <laughs> um, so, um, Solomon, Andrew Solomon felt comfort in his strict Jewish background. Um, Parker Palmer got pretty annoyed at being too strict, you know, and falsely blaming God for things that have nothing to do with God. And then Anita Barrow's mother really messed her up in terms of so this little girl, you know, if her mom says, I talk to God every day, this little girl says, well, why doesn't God fix my mom, right? Why does God let my mother sit in the room and cry all day? Well, yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. And, um, you know, that takes a lot of working out because she did depend on her mother and her mother couldn't respond. And then she called it God, right? God was the cause of her inability in the mind of a child. So, um, so whatever you picked out on your own or whatever might have triggered a reaction in what I said, I'm going to put you in groups now for 15 minutes and see what you come up with. I would like somebody also to report in. So the person who runs it gives a brief report of what you went through, what you decided. I'm, you don't, I do want to make sure everybody talks, but it doesn't have to be a rigid, you know, go around the circle thing, but everybody should chip in. Okay. And if you feel like you want to talk, Raise, I think you can raise your hand in your breakout groups, right? And the person in charge should make sure everybody contributes. So, all right. So let's go for it.
All right, so who is the reporter from group one? Which group is group one and which one's group two? Actually, Destiny, I think your group was group one. We didn't really have a leader per se, but um, I can be the spokesperson if you guys want. That's why don't you do it, Destiny, this time and somebody else do it next time. Yeah, you can go ahead and explain what we discussed. <laughs> go so, ahead. So we talked about, um, first we talked about depression. Uh, and when we ran out of comments for that, we talked about the stress one. Um, in terms of depression, we talked about how it was often caused by societal influences um, like people in power exploiting others, um, poverty. I linked it specifically to capitalism. Um, I think that the exploitation under capitalism is a chief cause of mental illness. Okay. Um, uh, we talked about how it's not always thoughts. It can be simply a feeling caused by the chemistry in your brain triggered by by um, nothing or by things that don't make sense. Um, it's not necessarily all thinking that you are worthless or that things don't matter. It's a, it can be a complete lack of motivation or complete lack of feeling altogether and that nothing can shake. Um, in terms of the stress article, we talked about how stress can be uh, it can be productive. Um, we can channel it into energy towards something or we can use it to avoid danger, but um, it's easily elevated to, um, oh, what's the word? A, it's used in the DSM-5. Um, not deconstructive, uh, dysfunctional. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, a dysfunctional level where it impairs your ability to act. Um, I think that's it, unless I missed something. Okay. Anybody else from that group want to talk? All right. What about the other group? Did you pick a spokesperson? I think we forgot that. Okay, as long as somebody is willing to report. And if I guess I'll go ahead and then since okay. I was the one who left and told you that we were done. Um, a lot of it was us like kind of trailing off into separation of church and state. Um, but I think a basic summary is like we um, authority figures like uh, teachers or parents or somebody of that nature um, often don't realize like just how influential they are in like your kid's decision making because like if, if somebody's super young and then you go up to them and are like hey this is what's right this is what's true and like in regards to religion or political ideology then that's what the kid will follow and then that can have serious impacts on the kid and then we referenced uh you said earlier i think you were talking about uh, how like the parent would shift the blame of oh so and so is just in this horrible car accident or so and so just died from cancer and a parent would just shift it it's it's all in god's plan honey like that's that's not very healthy um and then we kind of just yeah I mean, it was like the, the woman, Anita, whose mother said she talks to God and Anita thinks, why doesn't God help my mother, right? Yeah, you're kind of like that. This mercy. I mean, kids are difficult and like, because we've all been kids at one point, I think we all know that we've been pain in the backside for our parents. Um, so raising a kid is definitely a challenge, but like, you shouldn't just shift the blame to somewhere else to explain the process. Right. I just think, again, this 
liberal arts education is based on the union of reason and faith. So as a kid is growing up, to tell them, well, let's think of the causes, right? And let's think of how we can prevent this. And let's, you know, find out which political leaders are trying to prevent this. In other words, you know, and then in the back of that, that's what you learn at church, that you're supposed to fix things, right? God gave you a brain, you're supposed to use it. It just seems like that's much healthier because then the kid's brain is all going, you know, this is good. I'm supposed to be thinking about stuff and I'm supposed to be contributing and solving problems. And that's the, that is the good. And you don't care if somebody calls it God or somebody calls it, you know, atheism. You just, right from when you're a kid, you just get focused on just using your mind your heart, soul, mind, and strength, they're all heading in the same direction. Does that make sense to you, Blaine? Yeah. Yeah, now I was like, uh, this, this is anecdotal. I was lucky whenever I was a kid, my mom was a nurse. So um, like, uh, I've, I've had family members with cancer. My, like my whole, my mom's whole side of the family, um, almost every male in that side has had skin cancer. Um, so like whenever I was like, why does so-and-so have skin cancer? She like broke it down and explained it to, me. um, and like to explain the science behind it rather than, oh, it's, it's God wills, honey, or it's, it's God's will, honey. Um, so like, I mean, cancer is just a, like a malformation and a mutation of the cell. So whenever she broke it down in science terms, like that was helpful. But then whenever I would see like one of my friends or one of my other family members, like it's all in God's will, that did nothing. Yeah. Well, not only does it do nothing, it creates horrible body chemistry, right? Your brain chemistry. How could you avoid not being really? Well, it just confuses somebody because it's like, is he trying to help or isn't he? And that's not something that an eight-year-old needs to ask just then. Well, not only that, you get this image of this God who's this dictator, heartless dictator. <laughs> I don't know. It, it's amazing to me. Um, did the rest of you ever, you know, did you talk about these images of God? Some of you are Muslim. Some of you are Buddhist. Like the Buddhist students I have often go, I was like, this is not, we didn't, we didn't go there, you know. We don't have this personal God that comes in there and does what he wants. Um, I don't know. Does anybody want to comment on that? Did you, Blaine, did your group talk about stress also or just depression? I think mainly it was the religion bit. We didn't really talk much about stress. Okay. Well, the thing about stress is that I think students, I think college students use the word a lot. Um, Raise your hand if you think, as a college student, do students use the word a lot? I don't know, you're not even on campus anymore. But is if, okay, Kasturi, is anybody else think that the word gets used a lot? Which word? Stress. A student will say, I'm stressed. I feel like that just, like surround school. Okay, that's like school is a very stressful thing. I don't so think like it's said enough school. personally. What? I don't think it's said enough personally. I think we should focus on mental health, not just on mental health day or on suicide prevention day, but we should incorporate into the system of school and work itself um, time and resources to alleviate stress. Right, I, okay. So. Uh, so I personally think that we use it a lot because as a high school student, I did IBDP. Uh, so while doing IB, I, I, it is that IB is a really tough course. It's very rigorous and we go through a lot of 
uh, stress. We go under stress a lot. And uh, like uh, we can hear this word from each and every student who is pursuing IB. And uh, as a college student at present, I hear a lot uh, from my classmates, my seniors and my juniors at AUW that they are feeling really stressed. So I feel that, yeah, we can hear it a lot as a college student as well. So here's the issue, Destiny. Um, uh, okay, so there's a couple points I want to make. Let me see if I can make them. Um, there's sometimes students try to tough it up. They don't want to think to themselves that they're stressed, right? They just repress it and repress it. That's unhealthy. Sometimes students perhaps um, validate it. Like it, it makes you legitimate to say you're stressed, you know? Oh, that for sure. I think that I think that that's a product of um, the lack of time and resources um, devoted to relieving stress in a work environment. Okay. This, there's this glorification under capitalism of production, and it's simply not healthy to be trying to produce all the time. Yeah, I mean, so I'm going to talk about that more when we do Hinduism, too, but um, in our society, and I don't know if it's true. Again, that's why I like having students from all around the world. Um, you are your CV, right? And you are your achievements. And so if you your identity gets caught up in your achievements, you can't always control that. And also, you know, you keep taking on way more than you really ought to just because you can't validate yourself unless you do. So there's certain things about societies that structure in stress as a problem. But with COVID and with the students from AUW, like they come from environments that <laughs> the Lion students can't imagine in terms of stress. And so somehow they have managed to cope to some extent. Um, so then the question is, and this was, this will come up again and again, and it was actually in the first article. This is the philosophy side of all of this talk, okay? It says, um, uh, gives you, okay, so, how your interior monologue really determines everything. So how you talk to yourself, right? And then, and that's the philosophy part, is that your idea of the good, your idea of God, as Blaine says, you know, you have his mother explains it with science, somebody else's mother explains it. That is really, I mean, that determines everything. Does that make sense? Um, because the internal dial monologue is that I'm going to look at science as the causes because that's what I think is the human good is to study physical causes for things and figure, figure it out. So behind everything we do is some idea of the good some idea of what a flourishing life is, what, you know, and the people's, the word God usually means good, my idea of the good. So that's what I'm trying to get at as a philosopher. And, um, and these articles are just pointing out that there is the traditional split between religion and science, the soul and the body and all that stuff is very artificial. It started with Descartes, the enlightenment, and um, it really is being rejected in a lot of ways at this point. But we still, our educational system still rewards the professor as a detached observer, right? I don't make judgments. I just report the facts. 
because if you had if you bring motions in there then you know it's going to be distorted but the trouble is it also threw out values and every single professor what they write about they have to think is good or they wouldn't do it right so there's something valuable about what i wrote about my dissertation and they and they deny it I just do the facts. Well, why did you pick those facts, right? And well, because my advisor made me. Well, why did you stick to wanting to get this uh, degree, right? There's always values involved. There, and the value is your, your idea of the good. This is what I wanted to do with my life. Well, why? So, um, so I think that once you link together those two, you have you've linked together a lot of the humanities with the sciences and to some extent the social sciences. But I think that's important. And and my main thing is that's what Aristotle was actually talking about. And his work got connected to, um, Neoplatonism, or Plato did, but it got connected to um, the Christianity, and then that got connected to more and more disembodied kind of interpretations of Christianity. And so when modern science was introduced into the West, it undermined the Catholic Church doctrine, and the Catholic Church doctrine included Aristotle. And so Aristotle got split off from modern science. But what I'm trying to say is that um, we'll look, we're going to go through Aristotle's virtues again. And again, I want to put you back into groups somewhat, hopefully, but I want to go through that list and think about it from the term, from the point of view of body chemistry that there's a science of this. Aristotle is a doctor's son, you know? He's not a priest. <laughs> He's not a Catholic priest. So this has been misunderstood over the years, um, which is unfortunate because, uh, let me see. I thought I had this all set up, but um, and that's what I, that's on your first paper, I do want you to um, think about this list I've given of Aristotle's virtues and how it is that they were intended to link uh, science and religion. Okay, so let's, they were, they, they never split off ideas, the idea of the good, um, and his idea of God actually was a very generic, uh, it's a, his idea of God is just that the universe, in the universe, what is ordered determines what comes to be over time. So he, he knew that the universe was constantly expanding, that was consistent with Aristotle's view, and he knew that life on the planet, everything was interrelated and it got more and more complex over time. So his principles of reality are that being um, has this drive toward higher and higher levels of being flourishing, but it does so within certain limiting conditions like the uh, gravity, the strong nuclear force, the, those overall conditions upon which or, you know, that limit what can actually evolve or how much things expand. So, um, and there's a lot of chaos and a lot of uncertainty and a lot of creativity and a lot of emergence. But in the end of the day, the ordered part limits the disordered part. Because um, if that weren't true, you would never, 
well, nothing would exist, but if you can't get that, you would never have a creature that eventually evolved whose purpose, the reason why they were fit and they survived and they kept flourishing was because they were reacting to uh, the outside world in, in more and more intellectual ways. And then, and they could understand the patterns that were actually out there and then they could predict things, they could avoid situations or pursue situations. They got more and more smart about how to survive, but they did that, it was possible and it succeeded because there was order out there for them to understand. And so, I mean, Aristotle's God is just this force of order that, that it doesn't have to be any sort of separate spooky thing. It's very generic. And the, the bottom line is, you know, it's natural for us to try to understand as much as we can in as many ways as we can in order to um, promote each other's flourishing. That's really the bottom line. And so now you look at, where you relook at what I showed, what we discussed before was his model of virtues. The goal is to flourish, it's a biological model. And then you can think of Newland, the biology of the spirit. This is, Newland is the closest one we do to his idea of how uh, spiritual life has this physical counterpart to it. And that we really are wired to um, treat each other well, to get along and to also take pride in ourselves because we have this concept of ourselves as somebody who cares about other people. Um, and Aristotle would say, well, the reason why that's natural and necessary is because we depend on other people, you know? So we ought to always teach our children to the golden rule and things like that because actually we depend on them. And if we don't, try to think about treating other people the way we want to get treated will do all this harm that eventually is self-destructive because you cannot live without other people. Um, all right, let's see. Each virtue is connected to some aspect of life. So um, self-control, that's these, two, the, the, these are the obvious ones, right? But, um, in the articles on, so we have Newland's biology, the spirit is very much like Aristotle's flourishing person. Then you have that problem of revenge and forgiveness, and you have depression and stress. Okay, so those are chemical imbalances, right? That the uh, cortisone, right, the um, stress reaction, the hypocalamus, I mean, all those uh, the parts of your brain, the deepest one, the deepest ones are related to fear, right? So in a lot of ways, um, a lot of the depression, the stress is, has its roots in the fact that we're vulnerable. We know we're vulnerable and it makes us afraid and it makes us want to protect ourselves, which is fine. It's a survival response. It's just when it goes too far. And for human beings, it really can go too far because we are social and political beings by nature. So from the time a child is born, they are socialized. And that's where parents can start them off at a very young age, learning how to fear or not fear, and they can get it wrong. And that really messes up a kid and it messes up their brain. It messes up the way they get formed. So um, if you teach your kid, right, that people are by nature evil, you can't trust them. How are you gonna possibly function in a world where people really depend on each other and need each other? So if you're teaching people that, you know, you can't trust people, 
how can you ever love people, right? Because love is vulnerability. And so if you say, I can't trust anyone, basically you can't love anyone. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so that's, that's why a lot of people broke away from religion and thought it was extremely, extremely um, harmful, negative, anti-science, awful. There's plenty of reasons for that, but um, it doesn't have to be that way. So courage. Then there's uh, generosity. So the stress thing starts out with a fear. The depression um, starts out with, I mean, it's, I, they didn't, I'm not sure they said exactly why, but like Parker Palmer said, yeah, sometimes you get depressed because you have this cause that you're living for and you're frustrated because nobody else cares about it, right? I mean, if you are, uh, if your whole way of teaching yourself how to think is oriented toward climate change, you're gonna be depressed because people don't care, they don't care enough. And so then the question is, what are you gonna do about it? How are you gonna figure out not to let your brain chemistry just go south and so you um you can't function but parker palmer says clinical depression when it gets uh is fundamentally different you just there's nothing there um then the stress that the student said stress can be a positive thing if you use that you know uh, stress to just keep pushing for your own education, for example. I think most of you, I hope I can say this, I know I said this when I was your age. I personally didn't know what I was going to major in for a long time. And I really didn't know what I was going to do with my life. And I quit school and oh my gosh, all this stuff. Um, but then I found out I, I like philosophy, right? But um, that's because I found something to live for, right? This is what I value. Ideas are really important. Americans do not acknowledge that. The society's falling apart, all this stuff. Um, but then I think most of you, some of you know what you want to major in, where you want to go. And that helps you with your resilience, right? You can overcome these stressors because you have a goal. Um, but I think those of you who even don't know yet, can what you have to do in times like that, unless you have a clinical problem, is just say, I'm doing the best I know, right? I know I have enough natural ability to end up at a school like this, I, my teachers have decided in their wisdom that there are certain things that have to be required. And I'm just going to trust that somebody knows what they're doing. Um, I might look back and say, I didn't get much out of my social science class, but I'm a humanities geek, okay? But I wish I'd been given more science and math and social science. Um, because I would be able to think better if I did. And, but sometimes students, most of the time, uh, sophomore slump is kind of a depression students get into because they don't know what they want. And um, so, that, so that's one way to overcome the various obstacles that get in the way is that I'm not quite sure what my ultimate goal is, but I, as far as I know, staying in school, doing my best and figuring it out, making sure my record, my transcript looks like my abilities, right? Don't underachieve, don't overachieve. And so if I think you keep the big picture in view, then you can overcome these things. But that's different than plain old clinical depression when you, can, you can't get up in the morning. And Andrew Solomon said, you know, things that should be easy or that you're afraid of just the most trivial things 
um, is, you know, a real problem because human beings are extremely vulnerable and they have these conversations in their head about what to be afraid of that can get really off. So the goal of a wise person is figuring out how to have what's in here match what's out there. And of course, it's extremely complicated, but you're always trying. That's the thing. And you're, you're trying to self-examine and not get into a rut, right? Not have that voice inside of you get in, you know, go south, get into a rut. Um, not being too angry. This is, okay, so generosity is important because we actually depend on each other. And so to be generous with your money or your time is not to say, well, I could be completely an independent person, but I'm going to go out there and do charity. I'm just going to go this, the second mile. No, no, that's not what Aristotle generosity. Generosity is, I do depend on you. And the system has been set up so that I have something you need that you can't get. So I'm going to, you know, help you flourish. That's all. Because I need people to help me flourish. So the generosity doesn't come from the point of view of someone who is self-sufficient. It comes as a recognition that we are all interdependent. Um, let's see. So... Um, so with Destiny's point, which is interesting, I, you know, magnanimity are those billionaires, right, like Bill Gates, who give back. Well, uh, in a capital system, a capitalist system makes billionaires, and it makes poverty. And so you can analyze, I used to teach Karl Marx, the way, the, the impact of an economic system on all of these emotions and it is, you know, profound. If you, money sticks to money, but if people think, and the voice inside people's head is that you're poor because you're lazy, right? And then you don't let people, don't even give them a chance. The system's set up to keep them poor and it's not because they're lazy. But if the, the you know, the conversation is because they're lazy, of course they're going to get depressed. How could they not get depressed? Um, seriously depressed, right? Anyway, so anger is responding to frustrations. And usually there's fear underneath that anger. So people are afraid, but then they don't. They cover that up and they just get angry. They find someone to blame. You can get too angry or not angry enough. And that's a body chemistry thing, right? And if somebody gets angry, obviously they get angry usually at somebody else. Well, then that triggers some kind of a fear response, stress response. There's a chemistry to that. And Aristotle says, you know, um, if people, if you underreact, if you really should be angry, but you don't get angry, that's passive aggressive or something, right? Um, or you just don't like anger. I hate conflict. I hate it. I have a phobia about it. But that's a bad thing because he says, and I remember reading this and going, how did you know? Um, people who don't get angry enough, it registers in their memory right? And they tend to hold grudges. They remember <laughs> when somebody hurt them or did something or when they should have gotten angry. And so it just sticks there. And again, that's a body chemistry thing. You could measure that if you had the right machines. Um, rational ambition, that's setting out your idea of the good, right? I think that I am good at this, as far as I know, here's the job where I would be able to actually exercise that capacity that I enjoy exercising and that I enjoy it because it's my way of contributing to the society or my way of contributing um, to the social good, right? I can help. 
some people prefer to help people right on, right? Immediate. I want to be uh, in the healthcare industry because I want to make people well. Um, I have a grandson that my, he's, he's, in, he's a STEM kid. He knew more math in kindergarten than I did. And he would be really good at cybersecurity, right? Somebody, look, I have all these STEM skills and I think I want to help people. I want to go into cybersecurity because that's basically how we fight our wars these days. So, so when you're deciding, you know, rational ambition, it just always has to combine your natural capacities with this recognition that we're social and political. So how can I use it to help people, right? In ways that don't just help one person or a few, but they help the society flourish. They protect it from outside harm, but they also enable it to, to go to a higher level of quality of life. Um, pride is going over and above. So you can imagine the body chemistry. There's a body chemistry to this. If people uh, at Lion or at AUW, everybody's got a job description. And the job description doesn't include, make sure that you're really kind hearted. And while you're doing this, make sure that you, you know, contact the student afterwards and uh, reassure them, <laughs> you know, it's all this stuff that people do over and above their job description that really creates a climate on the campus. And that, again, affects your body chemistry because we are these very biological, physiological creatures. And we can get our list of things that we had to do that day, we can get it done and every single interaction we had with the person was kind of feisty and annoying, you know, and you go home with a completely different body chemistry than if every single reaction was mutually supportive and all that, even though you, you had the list, you had the same list and you got it done, but you're a completely different person by the end of the day. So um, that's a rational humor. When you get frustrated, you learn how to um, joke, make jokes that aren't the jo the the punchline of the joke is not being cynical. You know, people are really stupid. Let me tell you this funny story about this stupid thing somebody did. I mean, that if that's ultimately cynical, then of course that's bad chemistry. But if you, you know, you are annoyed with somebody, but then you find a way to sort of make light of it. Um, other times, of course, you have to forgive people, but sometimes it's just sort of, you get into an absurd situation and you could get really frustrated or you could just go, boy, this is like out of a funny movie, which is why, you should, why some mo funny movies are funny because because people could think yeah i've been in a situation like that and it's pretty annoying and it's pretty scary but it's also pretty funny so that's brain chemistry friendships really important right because we depend on each other sociability is important you don't start getting into little fights about minor things um and i think right now um, there are politicians that really benefit from trying to create a climate, a social climate, where people will really get annoyed with each other um, based on stuff that they can't control, based on things that prevent them from weaving themselves together and having a high quality of social life. So the polarization of the country, right? A lot of that is just unnecessary, um, unproductive. And it, so sociability is important that you start out with some kind of empathy and you wanna listen to another person. Truthfulness, knowing yourself. If you have 
um, overinflated ideas of yourself, you're going to be frustrated, unhappy. If you underestimate your ability, again, your, your body chemistry is going to go south. <laughs> All right, so those are the personal virtues. And we are going to get to the political ones starting next time, because obviously you can't really separate them. The thing that amazes me, however, is that my students often do separate them. Um, and that's where, um, right now, just to give an example, and again, I've talked too much, but so the hours, the class is almost over, but um, so students these days are under a lot of stress. Um, when I first started teaching, environmental issues have always been number one, because they are number one. <laughs> you know, they're not going to go away. Um, they, and they are going to get worse. Now, the other things, the, the justice issues, is Saddam Hussein going to change his mind? Or are we going to be able to go in there and what? What is, what are the Taliban going to do? Those are all, you can sort of predict what the Taliban is going to do, but those are still the realm of human choice. Whatever any human being chooses or not, climate change is upon us, right? And our choices affect how much it is, but anyway. So that was, that was how I got started in this. But students were oblivious and for a while there in the 80s, Ronald Reagan, it's always morning in America, everything's great. And that wasn't what was happening. The middle class were shrinking, but students were really oblivious. And so as the years passed, then that with 9-11, uh, you know, that was a big shocker, but that it's just amazing how after, I don't know, six years or so, Students are back into sort of picturing their lives and thinking, you know, it's going to work out. And then all of a sudden we have the economic collapse, right? And then students are getting a little bit more annoyed. <laughs> well, yeah, the middle class is shrinking, you guys. Um, and then we have COVID, right? Now, there's, you know, people don't want to get vaccinated. And then, so students are under a lot of stress, I know, but they still have to figure out how to cope with it. But they also need to know it's not just personal. I mean, you have to cope with it personally, but, but the causes of those stresses are not just the human condition. They are, uh, some of them are the result of the choices of your elders. <laughs> your elders made choices that were based on more immediate consequences and not on long-term consequences. And so we pass on to the next generation real stressors that those students will have to figure out how to cope with those as they live their lives. So um, each of you has to figure out, you know, how do I think I can flourish to the highest level possible? And I'm going to have to cope with COVID and partly, you know, that there's lots of reasons for it and you can assess those reasons, but still at the end of the day, of course, you have to have resilience. So what is that? Voice inside of you that, I'm you, right. that you can um, say to yourself, how do you formulate your kind of vision that can enable you to sort of get through the stressors and the depression, unless it's genetic, right? And maximize your flourishing. Um, and I do think friendships are really important but you better have good friends because <laughs> if they break down, that's really not good. Um, so, so your paper's coming up due in, a, I don't know, a week or something. 
I have all the paper topics there. We've talked about the Greeks and we've, and this is the last of it. So it's focused a lot on the personal virtues and then Socrates had those virtues. Again, you could talk about Socrates confrontation with the political leaders, um, but, and if you have questions, I will stay after class and ask your questions. Well, you should look at the requirements for the papers and the paper topics and all that before you ask a question. But on the other hand, I've always liked talking to students about their thesis statements. So if you want, if you have a thesis statement an outline, or you just want to talk to me about an idea, I really like that. I mean, that's what I feel I'm here for. I just, I don't think I can require it in, um, at AUW because the, I can't be available nearly as many hours as I can when I used to sit in my office at Lyon. So, um, so I'll, I'm gonna turn off the recording and I'm gonna let you go. And if you have questions, you can stay or you can make an appointment with me Anytime this time of day is fine because my other class will have been over, but um, that's it.